This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, well, thank you for coming this afternoon. This is going to be uh, a little different seminar from what you're used to. Instead of giving, getting, uh, receiving some data and some facts, we're going to have the students from Water Culture 4940 uh, give their final oral presentation from their trip to Easter Island. This is a special topics class that's offered this semester. Um, thanks to the generosity of Susan Lynch, who's uh, been a very generous donor to the the College of Agriculture, and uh, as part of this class, the students spent their spring break on Easter Island, which, as you know, is part of Chile. And they're going to talk to us today about what they did. Uh, not all our class normally meets on Tuesday, so um, they couldn't. Uh, not all the students could come here today. These are the these are the ones that we got out there. Let's spending the entirety of our first day and a portion of the second day with the city. Nevertheless, we welcomed the opportunity and ended up enjoying our time in Santiago. After checking into our hotel, which was very modernistic and comfortable, we set out on foot to find Los Dominicos, which is an open-air handcraft market that features handmade artisanal goods. Here we spent a few hours pursuing the wares and crafts, which included everything from pet parrots to ceramics and jewelry. Following the time we spent at Los Dominicos, we all enjoyed a delicious meal spent in the restaurant specializing in Peruvian cuisine. The following day, before settling out for Easter Island, we hopped on a double-decker bus and received a tour of Santiago and learned about its history with the assistance of a guide. We passed through its many districts and saw a handful of important sites, which included the Palacio de la Moneda, which serves as the seat of the president. After an informative tour of Santiago, we headed to the airport and were on our way to Easter Island. So, um, the village of Hongaro was like any other village we've ever been to. Um, it was very small and had only a few cobblestone roads that led to, um, led to the, the small beach in town that seemed to be the social center of the island. There were bars and restaurants that lined the streets where there was open air seating and like, always this tropical island music that you could hear playing as you walk by. Um, we learned that the main mode of transportation was most, they had a lot of cars and trucks, but because of the a lot of dirt roads there, they used a lot of dirt bikes. Um, and once in a while, we, we passed on the street by someone on, a, on horseback, riding around town. Um, we were also granted the company of a lot of, you know, many dogs walking the streets. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, we, at first we thought they were all strays, but we quickly learned from our tour guide that they're actually, um, they're all owned. They're just part of that laid back kind of life where they just let them own free. Um, uh, the uh, town also blessed us with a Palm Sunday Mass with Psalm, Psalm, sorry, Psalm Sunday in uh, Rapa Nui, which is their traditional language. Um, there was also a fresh produce market and plenty of shops. So while we were in Easter Island and Santiago, we got the chance to experience various delicious foods. Um, so breakfast usually consisted of fresh fruit, um, eggs, crepes, um, here's a, a, the omelet that we got to eat, but always fresh uh, fruit juice. So the meals that we usually had were very meat heavy, so it was hard to find vegetarian meals. Most meals uh, included freshly caught fish, and um, others included local beef and chicken. The meals also included um, island-grown taro and sweet potatoes. But the sweet potatoes there are actually, what they call sweet potatoes, are actually yams. And they, uh, came, they're very prevalent on the island and came in both yeah, orange and purple. <laughs> um, 
So the meals there were tended to be a mix between both Chilean traditional food, but with more seafood, and also um, more westernized meals, like we had pizza one night. Um, we all got to try ceviche, which was the first for me, and it ended up being really delicious. And Dr. B got to have his favorite traditional Chilean drink, the pisco sour. Um, and so due to, but due to the island's remote location, and the high invitation costs, all food prices were really, really high. But overall, we all really enjoyed the food and enjoyed the thing I got to offer. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what a moai and aku are. Um, here you'll see a picture of the moai, which are the human-like figures, which are carved of stone. And um, they are really known to have distinct hands and long fingernails. And they're standing on a platform, which is called an aku. The aku are long with wings, and they have a uh, stones in front of them. These are primarily used um, as a way to worship the ancestors. And so people actually actually come in front of the Ahu and sit and gather to have different ceremonies in order to um, worship their ancestors. We visited two different Ahus. Here you'll see this is Ahu Tongariki, where they actually have 15 standing moai. Um, another one we went to was Ahu Tahai. But they didn't have quite as many moai, but they, and they were as well preserved, but it was still a very well established ahu on the island. Um, also at Ahu Tahai, we were able to see this structure, which was uh, the remnants of an old house, which was actually the way they had it was um, just this um, round framework with a canoe was actually placed on top of it. And so it was just a very small shelter that they would just use because they're mainly outdoor people because of the good weather, um, but they would just have this small shelter that they would use to sleep in, and most of their time was spent outdoors. So on our second day, we visited the volcanic crater uh, Ranararaku, which is on the side of the quarry where most of the Moai were carved. And um, we had a special opportunity here to talk with archaeologists from UCLA who were completing um, <coughs> an excavation of some of the Moai, which you can see right here. Um, these statues were carved in any position that they would kind of fit into the rock using stone tools called toki. Um, and these are made of basalt and subsidian rocks. Um, the spine was the last, they would carve face up on their backs and the spine was the last portion um, carved and cut away from the rock and then they would be set up in a pit so that the back of the moai could be carved and often had um, interesting designs called petroglyphs in them. Um, Around 90 moai have been excavated from the quarry, and a lot of them were excavated in non-archaeological conditions, which has made piecing together the history of the moai much tougher for archaeologists today. We also um, had the opportunity to see the moai in transport down from the quarry in places where they had fallen or broken, and um, also been placed into the ground and just never taken out of there, and so the, the soil has filled in around and it had a very eerie and um, human parents you can see that here. <laughs> um, Puna Pau was another quarry we got to visit on our itinerary. Um, it's the, the quarry where the top knots were made. The top knots are these, um, they're almost like hats, they're round. Uh, carved out of red scoria. It's a different rock than the moai were carved out of. Um, only certain moai got to wear these and, and it showed that they were of higher power to be in the chief. Um, um, there are several theories about how the uh, top knots were placed on top of the moai. One of the theories is whether or not the moai were laying down and they kind of like tied up with rope on their heads and then they erected it straight up. Um, but these are all theories and we don't really know exactly how they were done. Um, so during our time at uh, East Island, we got to hike to one of those, or several of the volcanoes, the three major ones, one of them being Puyke. It took us roughly 30 minutes to reach the top of the highest point there. And once there, we were amazed by how isolated we felt looking at in the distance. And there's basically a thousand miles of uninterrupted, or largely uninterrupted sea, just anywhere you can see. And so we then followed Ramon and our guide to the other side of the hills, where there was a site of very early Moai statues. Uh, it's been determined that these statues were likely the smallest, and that they got larger as time went on. They kept carving larger and larger statues. And so these Moai were likely carved between the states of 900 and 1100 AD. After this site, we continued 
feed onto a cave made by a wild tooth, and then there's the cave of the virgins. But the women were once kept to pale their skin because paleness was a sign of beauty in that culture. So they were kept there for months. And so we got to crawl in there five at a time and see the petroglyphs car on the side of the wall. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Rano Cal. Um, it's one of the larger volcanic craters on the island. Um, it's about 200,000 years old and a mile in diameter, and to this day, it's probably one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. Um, not only is it aesthetically really pretty, but it's also like an enormous set, source of um, sustaining the population of Easter Island with its like vast array of plants uh, and life within the crater. Um, we learned about Ramon, our guide talked to us a lot about like the biodiversity that is in the crater. Um, there's a medicinal fern that lies within the crater that is used to treat cancer. Um, there's also been analysis of the mud water composition that has been um, determined to stunt the growth of DNA, increasing the longevity of um, life, which I mean, we can kind of say that instead of many like that many years. And as well as recently, there have been. Um, Plants have served as their origin of the municipal address, uh, which, as Ramon told us, um, the rapid new people get VIP access to it. Uh -huh. So, Kuo Hero is the fertility stone that the ancient rapid new people played to promote fertility among its people. The noise made by the fertility stone um, resembles a conch shell. Fertility petroglyphs are carved into the stone all over its surface showing the significance of fertility in their culture. Ramon showed us how to play the stone, which can be quite the task. You can either um, cup one end to the other side of that hole and hit it to make the sound, or you can blow into it. So a few of us gave it a try, and only Joy is here was successful. <laughs> <laughs> it out. Um, and there are also bugs crawling in another bit, which also made it a little difficult. Um, so our next stop this day was to the navel of the world, and this is a stone that is said to have been carried to the island by the, its first king, Hotu Matua. <coughs> Having to travel thousands of miles across the Pacific with this large stone um, proved its meaning to the Rakhine people. It is said to possess heavy doses of mana, the spiritual power bestowed by the gods. From placing one's hands on the stone, mana will bring them health and energy. We all got the chance to touch the stone before leaving the site in hopes that we would absorb some of this energy. So I'm going to talk about building and circling and tell you guys a little bit about the Bermuda cult. Um, so on our first day at the island, we visited Random Cat, which I had talked about before, and Arongo. And um, back um, in history, historically, Arongo used to be the center of the village. And um, during the Bermuda cult era, which is when basically you had rivaling tribes or clans, and they each year would so they pulled a competition where like young boys would um, compete to for the following year. So they would swim out to the islands, which are shown um, in the picture of Mata Nui and Mata And they would swim out there, and the person who collects an egg and gets back up the mountain um, first is the one who will basically go out there. And um, basically, the egg had to be intact, and um, you had to, um, they also spent some time out on the islands once they got there, um, meditating and kind of getting touched spiritually with um, So that was interesting. We learned about that from out there. And then um, later in the week, we had a chance to go out and on a boat ride and um, see the, like, the islands up close, and which were really cool. The water was beautiful. It was a blue, like the brightest blue indigo you'll ever see, and it was really pretty. And um, it was just amazing to see that like, people had to swim out there and actually come back and skip. Uh, you don't see it here, but you can probably see in that picture that the mountain side is pretty steep, so it must have been pretty difficult to scale, like trying to keep the egg cat. And a lot of times our floor guide remotes that, that people put in their, like, could put them in their mouths and stuff, and like, that kind of thing. So, and then it was like a really rainy day when we did this, and um, Ramon was like, well, it's once a lifetime opportunity to be all about the circling. And it was interesting to see because there weren't a lot of fish or anything, and it was really like not your typical snorkeling experience because it wasn't like that much like coral life or um, anything like in the sea very much. Like we saw probably three fish, but it was awesome uh, nonetheless. Um, and on the way back, we saw about like multiple rainbows framing the um, coast on, so it was really pretty. Um, much of our time was spent learning about local flora at the 
the Botanical Garden of Kana. Kana is extremely active in mm, conservation of biodiversity and involving the local community in their efforts. Um, they grow a lot of uh, endemic and her medicinal plants in their nursery and distribute them to the local to the locals. And last year they gave out thirty thousand plants to the Rapa Nui people. And Oh, also cannabis um, currently involved in attempting to reintroduce and plant um, more endemic or endangered plants back to the uh, Easter Island. Uh, for example, they are reintroducing the Sophora toromyo trees, which are endemic to Easter Island and almost when I think almost when I think at some point. Um, they also have uh, display of the traditional Rabanui agriculture methods like the Mung Nano Vine, which are stone structures built around the plants to protect them from livestock and wind or storm water, and creating a microclimate to provide the optimum moisture and temperature. So we got to visit the hospital on Rabanui. Because Easter Island has a long tradition of using herbal medicines, many islanders have wanted them to be used in the hospital. So as a compromise, there's a special room attached to the hospital with a separate entrance. And this allows patients to have a choice of choosing um, traditional or occidental medicine. And we were able to tour the facilities and talk with Pamela Huck, the president of the board of Rapid Traditional Medicine. And she told us that herbal treatments are the only one aspect of their holistic approach to healing, which treats the entire mind and body of the patient. Pamela works with three other islanders, in addition to visiting physicians and anthropology students. In order to stretch the very limited budget of the traditional medicine program, Pamela is now using a radio show to help the Rapanui people learn how to grow and use medicinal plants um, at home as well as at the hospital. So the artisan market was one of the last stops that we made uh, in Rapa Nui. So towards the end of our trip, we went to the artisan market down the road from our hotel. Essentially, it's kind of like a gift shop of our experience. So we were able to grab a couple souvenirs there. And uh, there was a plenty of handcrafted, handcrafted uh, souvenirs and uh, turtle made out of stone and wood. And it's just really awesome and traditional um, uh, crafts. And uh, one of our classmates, Liz, was able to purchase a handcrafted wood structure that she actually saw the woman doing at the site, so that was kind of cool. And it showed really authentic. <laughs> so after one of our last dinners together on the island, we headed to Kari Kari, a local performance held in the town that draws in both native and foreign people. Um, so when the instru instrumental section of this act came out, there were a lot of drummers and guitarists and auxiliary percussionists. Uh, we were immediately impressed with their talent and energy expressed through their music. Next, the dancers and singers filled the stage with their traditional song and dance. Here. Um, now, I can't believe the most exciting part of the night as a part of the Kari Kari show. <laughs> um, the performers went through the crowd and shows a lot of to get up on stage. Um, so several of us, including myself, got the exhilarating opportunity to express ourselves revenue style. <laughs> One of us proved to be quite the star. Oh, you go back. <laughs> 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 um, she fit right in with the vibrant and artful culture here. So after seeing the Kari Kari ballet, um, it seemed very apparent that they probably performed this in order to keep the traditional revenue culture alive through its younger people. And it seems as though it served as an educational tool by exposing spectators to their cultural song dance. Alright, so Manakata Beach is the beach on Easter Island. Um, it is said to be the landing place of a Polynesian chief and, and settlers. So these settlers created the first settlements on Rapa Nui. Um, we, going up to the beach, uh, Ramon told us of a tsunami that hit the island previously and wiped out 95% of the sand. So what we saw there was what was left and it still looked like a gorgeous beach that you'd want to be at. Um, it's currently home to two ahus, as we learned of earlier, um, one of which is currently under construction, and the other homes six moai statues. Um, now this was a particularly significant day for myself, 
because it was my first time stepping foot into an ocean. Armpit problems, we don't get out much. <laughs> but, uh, great experience. The water was a deep, deep blue, very salty. Uh, we were all loving life. Dr. D was floating off into the distance. <laughs> 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 there's, a, there's also a, a palm tree grove off to the side to get out of the sun. Very good experience. Um, on our last day, we got the opportunity to check to the top of Manga Teravaca via horseback. Um, Manga Teravaca is the highest point on Easter Island at 507 meters. Um, we so we, this was our only opportunity to get to the top, so we're very excited. Um, the views were incredible the entire way up, as you can see. And when we got to the top, we all jumped off our horses and left them at a watering hole to graze, and we all watched to the, it wasn't very far, but to the very top. And um, so when we were at the top, we got to take even more incredible pictures. And we could see the curvature of the Earth on the horizon, because you could see so much of the ocean around you, which was really incredible. Um, on our way back down, we got to see even more great views of Hangaroa and the ocean around us. And um, the weather held out perfectly. It was a beautiful sunny day. We all got plenty sunburned. Um, and on that, but just right as we were getting back to the ranch, it started to drizzle a little, which actually was welcome after the hot day in the sun. Um, so this was actually the high point of my trip, and I think everyone agrees that it was a well worthwhile trip. So, uh, I'm Richard Childers. I was the kind of de facto translator for the trip, being the most fluent in Spanish. And so when we're here in the States, we never really worry about whether or not the guy at Starbucks is going to be able to understand our latte order. It's nice simply a given we'll be able to communicate and express ourselves and what we want. So as a fluent Spanish speaker who took the lazy route and only really traveled abroad in South America, uh, it's sometimes difficult for me to understand this concept of not being able to express myself. So I had the pleasure to put my fluency to good use during our trip. And although there were times I forgot what language I was speaking and to whom amidst a flurry of questions, I never had to deal with the concept of not being able to get my point across. Of just not being able to pull the waiter aside and ask if this strange sauce I've never seen before has shellfish or if the empanadas are vegan or not. <laughs> so although I tried to find answers for as many questions as I could, especially in real time, which are kind of crazy, uh, I know it must have been a hassle for you to deal with. And so I also know there's a fair bit of culture that one misses out on in such cases. There were times when locals would crack little jokes or tell stories and I'd be the only one chuckling. So I was just like creeper in the corner. <laughs> and believe me, if uh, retelling a joke lessens the humor, translating it makes it 10 times worse. And this was no exception. I want to thank all of you who laughed anyhow. I'm really sorry I couldn't make it more understandable for me. So I guess in general, I'd like to recognize my fellow group members uh, both for their patience and flexibility, and for their dedication to going and learning and having fun, no matter what the language barriers. And I hope that through my translation, I kind of ease some of these difficulties. So now we'll begin the part of the presentation where we talk about um, the many research projects that different uh, groups of students on the trip um, developed and participated in throughout the trip. Um, the project group that I was in charge of was a sort of plant identification scavenger hunt in which we um, looked at the biodiversity on island by comparing what species we thought would be there from looking at um, finding species names in books and on the internet that were connected with uh, Easter Island. And before the trip, we were able to find 131 species names specifically associated with Easter Island. Um, but finding a total species number was quite challenging. And we came up with 212 from a few different sources online. And this was a number that was challenging to find because often um, the number 47 would be mentioned as the number of native higher plant species on the island, which is kind of ambiguous. Um, this fairly small species count gave us the idea that the biodiversity in the island would be very low and that it would be fairly barren and desolate. However, upon arriving, we discovered that this was not in fact the case. Much of the island is covered in rolling grass vistas, and you wouldn't know it from the large variety of trees, mango, avocado, palm, chinaberry, eucalyptus, 
beautiful cultivated tropical flowers and plants, general lush vegetation, uh, of the island's only town, Angaroa. Uh, we were lucky enough to visit our tour guide's house for lunch and explore his extensive and frankly overwhelming gardens, which contain many classic tropical plants that are found across the globe, uh, which we hadn't included previously on our list. Overall, we photographed 101 more species than the original 131, and we're also able to find and photograph many of those as well. Uh, the two methods for attaining our species counts were combined, allowing us to account for 232 species on the island, 20 more than the number of 212 that we previously documented. So after the trip, we all, everyone in our group, um, was reflected on the plant biodiversity on the island, and we came up with some interesting conclusions. Um, the species count is low, especially even in comparison to our local Ithaca, New York. Um, in many ways, this actually provided a greater experience of the concept of biodiversity because we were able to understand the vastness and subtlety of difference within the kingdom plantae on a comprehensible scale. Um, even if only 232 species, we learned about and experienced firsthand harmful, medicinal, delicious, and fascinating plants found all across the island. We saw grasses that make horses ill, plants that treat cancer, and enjoyed fresh mangoes off of a tree just steps away from our hotel on a daily basis. Uh, the prevalence of food crops was especially notable in terms of people's ability to create their own sustainable paradise. Um, the biodiversity was also emphasized by the hotspot that um, Alexa mentioned, Grano Cow, in which almost all of the plants on the island grow, and some plants that are found nowhere else on the island grow. So, like most people haven't considered this term, uh, the OED defines biodiversity as the diversity of plant and animal life, especially as represented by the number of extant species. We discovered that this term is uh, both nuanced and complicated and carries numerous implications, and it's important to consider in the context of specific places. Simply counting species numbers skews one's perspective of a place and of, of their perception of ecosystem sustainability and value. And so it also is a fatalistic perspective for a place like Easter Island and fails to consider that the people, like the Rapanui, can restore the biodiversity of their environment. By attempting to document biodiversity in a stereotypical way, we ended up discovering that this concept is much harder to nail down than once we thought, and that it means more than just a number. And these are some pictures of plants that we found, both native and uh, a little bit more typical. So, hi, I'm Alexa. Um, I, me and Maddie kind of took um, charge of this group. We came up with the idea of transects, and Megan um, helped us out with um, taking transects on the island. Um, and we kind of did something similar to Alyssa's group, but we kind of tried to make it a little bit more quantitative, <coughs> as much as we can, considering we um, had limited transects. Um, but we decided to do, the objective of our plant of biodiversity to say was to assess the composition of plant species throughout Easter Island um, based on our data. And um, so given the history of the deforestation of Easter Island and the depletion of the native plant flora, it was a big question in our minds as to like, okay, what plant species are there and like where, what is their spread like on the island? So our goal is to obtain a quantitative analysis of the species diversity at various locations on the island by calculating like, a percentage of abundance of uh, each species recorded at each site that we visited. Um, so prior to departure, our group and Liz's group kind of worked together to compile a plant species ID booklet um, off the internet and like getting pictures off the internet that we could identify what we found. And while on the island, we um, took transects at each um, spot, as many spots as we could that we visited. And our transect was eight meters in length and we did Four meter plots, four meter, no, four one meter plots um, across the transect and photographed each species that we found on the transect and surrounding it as well. We it was <coughs> and um, we identified it using the previous ID booklet. Um, we took data at um, Random Veracu, the highest point at Manga Terabaka, which is kind of photographed, um, Koiki Peninsula, Konaf, um, Um, so the, the our poster in the hallway shows a figure with the species compositions that we found, and we found that there was a range of abundances and varieties of different species at each site. 
Each all sites, though, had a large number of varying species of grass, and speculation says that this grassland landscape has existed on the island since the natives over harvested the trees for timber and overused slash and burn um, agriculture techniques to um, feed the overpopulation in the 15th century. The peak of this populace was recorded between 7,000 and 10,000 inhabitants on the island, um, but it's controversial, however, whether or not this directly related in the deforestation. Regardless, deforestation did lead to the dwindling and um, extinction of various um, original native species. Um, an example of this being the native palm tree, which was harvested for lumber and all the nuts were eaten by both humans and rats that were brought to the island. Um, as a result, it was eliminated as a species. Um, our, when comparing the results of the various sites, um, you can tell, see that the difference in native versus invasive between CONAF and the other sites, quite obviously. Um, this is due to CONAF's restoration um, project for the native plants of Easter Island. So within their borders, they contained much less invasive species, but outside of their control um, was quite the opposite. So the establishment of invasive species is specially facilitated in the areas where there is no restoration of projects. Um, in the future, increased number and size of transects um, in more locations would probably be needed to get an accurate biodiversity assay of the island. Um, an investigation into why each site um, where it's composed of different species would also be really interesting and could be done by um, a more um, comprehensive composite plant composition species throughout the island and studies of the various microclimates and histories on topography of the land. So I will be presenting Matthew Bond's <coughs> research objectives and findings. Um, you can be here for the presentation, but he will be here after um, minutes if, you, if anybody has questions for him. So the goal of Matthew's research project was to conduct a survey of the plants used in rapid immune medicine. Approximately 80% of the world's population relies primarily on natural health products as sources of medicine. This occurs even in areas where Western biomedicine is available due to easier access, cultural preference, and lower cost. Easter Island is an ideal location to survey medicinal plants because the use of herbal medicines is a strong part of their culture. This island hospital, or the island hospital, even includes an attached clinic where traditional medicines are administered, like discussed before. Because very few books and articles have been written about the Rapa Nui and ethnobotany, most information was gained by interviewing four of the islanders who were showing us archaeological sites. Ramon, our tour guide, also helped us out with this. Um, he grew up on the island and used many medicinal plants regularly, regularly such as a mixture of ginger root and sugar cane which was taken for cost and stomach cramps. While Ramon drove us around the island, he also pointed out plants like castor bean growing along the road, which can be used to ease joint pain and inflammation. One of Ramon's friends had even spent several years being treated at the hospital with very little effect, and after being switched to using castor bean instead of um, contemporary medicine, her condition rapid, rapidly improved. So, interesting story. Another important source of ethnobotanical information was George, the growing manager of Conan. He described several important medicinal species. One of these is Pau Nako Nako, a plant in the nightshade family which produces a small tomato-like berry. This fruit is very nutritious and is eaten to treat rashes and stomach ailments. One of the most interesting plants we saw was Matua Pua, a fern that has shown high potential in tests as an anti-cancer drug. The islanders drink a tea made from its roots to treat fractures, sprains, menstrual cramps, burns, and bruises. The person we met with the most knowledge of herbal medicine was Pamela Puck um, from the traditional side of the hospital. She grows dozens of plants at her house on Konaf property and other locations on the island used for treating for patients. This project identified a total of 23 medicinal plants representing 20 different families. However, this is most likely only a fraction of all of the plants used on Easter Island. Because of the use of herbal treatments on the island, it is still alive and well both at the hospital and in daily living. Easter Island provided an ideal location to study not only the plants, <coughs> but the context of how they are integrated into rapid culture. 
All right, so many of us being from horse backgrounds thought it would be interesting to study horses and <coughs> biodiversity effects on the island. So Elizabeth, Jay, and myself headed up this research group. Um, we learned that earlier in the history on Easter Island, horses were consumed as a source of food. But now that biodiversity is on its way upward and resources are more <coughs> readily available, the horse meat is no longer needed. Uh, but because of the overpopulation of horses, uh, many of the natives would like to see the consumption of horses promoted once again to control the population. Currently on the island, there are 5,000 horses and 5,800 people, so it's just about a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, when we were talking to the researchers at CONAF, they said that ideally they'd like to see two to four hectares per horse on the island. And the island is 160 hectares, square kilometers. Um, so when doing the math, you would need 100 to 200 square kilometers of land. So they are dealing with space issues. Um, when talking to CONAP, their goal is to reintroduce the uh, spe like native species and various other plants to the island and they're facing many issues with horses as far as keeping those plants alive. So they're often building barriers around the plants, shrubbery, whatnot, to keep the horses out. And if you go back to the previous picture, they're trying to keep the horses away from the Moai statues. The, Moai, the horses are using the Ahus and the Moais as scratching posts. So they're actually eroding away the statues. So they put in these turnstiles that ideally only humans are this could get people <laughs> there are horses on the other side and they are grazing directly in front of the Moais and using them as rubbing posts. So they're, they're doing what they can to keep them out. Jason, but can you go back? Are those bowls or bowls or gopher bowls or, or something else? Even? These here? Yes. yes. Those are rocks. Those are rocks. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, and also. Um, Horses, they're all owned. The 5,000 horses on the island, they're all owned by someone. But they're roaming free, and they mostly, they mostly take care of themselves. So you'll, all, you'll always see a brand on them, um, signifying their owner. Um, and often, horses are seen as a status symbol on the island. The more horses you have, the higher you are. Uh, so some natives would like to see a rule put in effect that limits a person to how many horses they can own. Often you'll see islanders utilizing them as transportation. Something you'll see so much now as you did in the past. So there. Sorry. So uh, my my group for our research group for uh, Young Fung, Caitlin and I was to investigate the food crops on Easter Island. Uh, we sorry, I'm really nervous. <laughs> so okay, so our to investigate the food crops on the island, and we also were interested in the climate and irrigation systems on the island. Um, the methods we used to collect our data was through uh, three sources: through using, uh, through observing at restaurants and menus and seeing what ingredients were often on the menus, uh, through observations at farms that we had visited and family family farms and gardens, and also at the local food markets. Um, what was imported and what was <coughs> locally grown. So the results that we found is that there was definitely a, a consistent group of crops that were consumed and also highly grown on the island. Um, such include taro, sweet potato, banana, mango, and guava. Guava, sorry. And uh, we found those as consistent staples in our meals, and also um, we saw them growing in the field, obviously. Um, the Museum, uh, museum de Anthropological Sebastian Eng Engler, which is a museum on Easter Island, uh, recognized 14 crops as the most important crops on Easter Island, some of which are food crops and some of which are eth ethnobotanically important and additionally important. Um, some of our meals, most of our meals consisted of, for breakfast, guava, mango, and banana, as my uh, Maddie had shown earlier. And for lunch, we had mostly sandwiches and, and our ingredients were mostly of tomato and cheese and um, my speculation 
things that she is imported if we didn't see cattle percentage or not at least an abundance enough to produce the uh, stock. <coughs> and for dinner, uh, mostly we had a side of fish with a side of sweet potato for uh, mashed or chips. And they had a variety of seafood on the island, um, consisting of tuna and shrimp. I think they had cobfish or And then lobster, we also had and uh, so uh, an observation that I just wanted to point out is that the size of the fruit was uh, obviously different for me, at least. Um, for example, the pineapples uh, were about like, seven to eight inches tall, whereas my mom can sometimes buy pineapples that are like huge. And then, uh, but in contrast, the watermelon was relatively large compared to the watermelon that we eat in the United States. So um, I thought that was another subject matter to be investigated in the future. Um, for, in terms of the marketplace, where we also collected some of our data and took uh, pictures, we found uh, various other crops, such as uh, cabbage, uh, basil, cilantro, chives, pumpkin, cucumber, garlic, uh, beets, some of which are imported and some of which are grown on the island. Um, another major uh, source for us for our information was Ramon, our tour guide, which we had discussed previously a lot. He's been a really great help to us in our project. And he uh, gives a tour of his garden at home where he grows pretty much all of the crops that I've mentioned previously and uh, discusses with us how he vegetatively propagates bananas <coughs> um, every nine months and how he cuts back the shoot after it fruits and new baby shoots emerge from the ground and it's kind of a continuous process that everyone practices on the island, which is really great. And some practices that are unique to Easter Island is. Um, with their incorporation of their culture and their agriculture practices is planting new uh, cuttings, plant cuttings during the new moon and planting seeds during the full moon. Also, uh, there is a prevalence of male farmers because women are, are traditionally are not supposed to be farming when they're on their menstruation cycle, so there's mostly male farmers for that purpose. And um, another traditional practice for agriculture is to have the menabai, which are the stone structures surrounding the trees, uh, which Young Fun had discussed, which are used to um, pretty much promote the optimum temperature and moisture on the plant within the structure by preventing uh, livestock from grazing on it and from environmental factors such as water and um, So the reason you might need to hold moisture in these plants why being monobi were used because Easter Island typically is a very hot tropical climate. Um, their hottest season, their, uh, their hottest season is typically what our winter would be and it's their driest season where they can receive anywhere between two to four inches per month, which really isn't that much water if you're 85 plus degrees um, and then not dropping below 60 at night. Um, and the soil there is also very dark. It's a weathered basalt soil that's um, high in pH, finely textured porous. Um, so having this dark, rich, and iron soil gets really hot really quickly. It doesn't hold in the moisture. Um, you will overwater it. Um, so uh, in the picture with the uh, drip irrigation, um, it kind of makes sense that they would have that just because you can see how dark the soil is there. So you can see posters from all of these presentations out from Paul and talk to us students um, who were involved in them afterwards if you have more questions. So in conclusion, I just wanted to talk about um, just throughout my time at Cornell, uh, the importance of hands-on inter interactions for sparking curiosity and promoting excitement has been reiterated again and again. Uh, this class followed above and beyond that trend. There's only so much literature research, writing papers, and attempting to memorize information that you can do to try to learn about something. <laughs> the real learning and education begins when you take this academic-based inquiry and connect it to a place through experience. When visiting a place for an academic trip, there's a tendency to avoid certain activities because they aren't educational or too touristy, which can actually limit, limit the experience's educational potential. So reflecting back on the trip, I can think of many new experiences, traveling with a large group, uh, being reliant on one person to communicate with a lot of the people for a week, and going out in a boat on the open ocean and riding on a horse for the first time for me. 
um, that really enhanced and clarified many things that I've learned about in school, just throughout my life. Um, now I have better communication, teamwork skills, and patience, uh, desire to learn my Spanish a lot better, <laughs> um, wonder why the ocean is so clear and what kind of organisms were on those rocks 15 meters below us when we were snorkeling, uh, and understand in a way that only writing can show you what it was like to travel around before there were cars. Uh, this knowledge of place and activity combined with Vigorous minds and ability to reflect on and contemplate our experiences were traits that I saw exemplified and taken advantage of by everyone in this group. And this provided an outstanding opportunity for learning and experience that I and everyone who went am glad to have. Before we take some questions, I, I forgot to uh, introduce the co-instructor of the class, Dr. Betsy Lamb. That's a jam. Yes. <laughs> so uh, since I, you know, I work on Long Island, I have to participate in this class long distance by video cam. But Betsy's here every week in the class, and so she does she does the majority of the work. So uh, thank you for her help on this. She joined us. On Do you have any questions for the students? Yes. See any. Reptiles or amphibians on the island? Are there any? There is, there is lizards in our room. <laughs> <laughs> um, but other than that, I don't know really so much. Just to add, the, the farms we visited, 
uh, you generally see one greenhouse structure and maybe a one to two acre lot of farmland with vegetables, small scale. And also, I mean, the great part of that is that, like, the island in general, the three fourths of it, I believe, is protected by Kona. And then they have the small town Pongaro, and so it only leaves a really small area of the island, which is even a lot of farmland. So, I mean, there's just, I mean, you have to have area that Real simple question: How how big is the island? What are the what are the distances? One hundred and sixty-eight square kilometers. So seven seven miles by fourteen miles, about. I mean, depending on where you take the measurements, sure. it's a kind of triangle shape. It's uh, half the size of Grand Island. I have the naive assumption, as I suppose a lot of people do, that uh, the way that the statues got the quarries wherever they ended up um, was, well, kind of unknown. Uh, right. Do the people that you talked to who lived on the island, do they have a an opinion about that? I know that when we went to the museum specifically, there was um, a few different things that had like, a couple different theories that kind of evolved from different uh, archaeologists that have been on the island at a time. Actually, the archaeologist, Jerry Van Tilburg, we talked to from UCLA, who was there at the time, they all had different theories. Uh, there's some that currently go from like them rolling them on logs, that the logs will roll them. There's different theories where um, they'll walk them. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different theories. And so it really depends on who you talk to because um, they haven't really ass assessed one as being correct. They just kind of have up those theories at this point. There was, a, there was a study not too long ago where they, they tried the theory of placing the moai on a skid and then having the logs roll the skid, and keep placing the logs in front of the skid. And they got very effective results. They got hundreds of feet after a long time. There was a TV program not long ago that showed the rotting. Right, the yeah. teetering. Yeah. 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 And they claimed that work. Yeah. But the interesting thing, of course, is that it's not flat. You're taking them right. from the volcanic quarry down and then to the coastline. I mean, when they told us theories like that, and we're standing on this large hill that they call a quarry, and we're saying, you want us to take this moai here all the way over there, and you're going to walk it? I mean, it just was so unfathomable to us at that point that, like, personally, I think a lot of the other methods seem more reasonable, but there's definitely um, a lot of support for those theories. The largest they were able to transfer was 30 feet high. I forget the tonnage times. Yeah. Like 86 tons. Yeah, so that's not what they're able to transport. The the build the largest ever carved was 60 feet high, but it still remains in the mountain. <laughs> in terms of um, the in terms of the oral tradition, though, there is support for the theory that the Moai walked because that is that is part of their oral tradition is the idea that. They say like the Moai walk, and so they they don't know how. But part of their oral tradition is that that is, and I did read one study which actually looked at a lot of the transport roads, and all of them had at least a slight downhill grade to the location of the Moai. So, as impossible as it seemed to us, it could that that is a plausible theory. Of course, it's a bit more romanticized than flipping the Moai on their stomachs and rolling them. Off. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite was the one that said they shot them out of the volcanoes, <laughs> <laughs> or the aliens. Moved Cody and James were for a TV documentary of the point of deforestation they resulted in cannibalism. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm across any cannibalism. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Thanks so much. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.